Welcome to the Metta Hour with Sharon Salzberg, where Buddhist wisdom meets everyday life. This podcast is brought to you by the Be Here Now Network and features interviews with the top leaders, teachers, and thinkers of the mindfulness movement and beyond. For more information, visit BeHereNowNetwork.com backslash Sharon. Hi, I'm Sharon Salzberg, and I'm so happy to be joined today by Dr. Kristen Neff. Kristen is an associate professor of educational psychology at the University of Texas at Austin. She's a pioneer in the fields of self-compassion research, conducting the first studies on self-compassion 15 years ago. And I believe she actually popularized the term, so we'll have to ask about that. She's the author of Self-Compassion, The Proven Power of Being Kind to Yourself. And she's also co-developed an empirically supported eight-week training program with Dr. Chris Germer that is taught worldwide, Mindful Self-Compassion. Her latest book, The Mindful Self-Compassion Workbook, is the result of this training and was published in August of 2018. Welcome, Kristen. Oh, thank you, Sharon. So, thank you so much for having me. It's such a delight. Now, I'm trying to remember when we met and where we met. Well, I sat with you at a retreat. You, I'm sure you don't remember the first time I met you. I sat with you at a big retreat at IMS a, a few times, and then I think we met a few years later. I can't remember where that was, though. It's true. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. So what brought you to uh, meditation to begin with? Well, I think probably the same thing that it brings a lot of people. I was just under a lot of stress. It was my um, I was finishing up my Ph.D. at uh, UC Berkeley, and I had heard meditation was good for stress, um, so I started learning to meditate. And uh, lucky for me, actually, the first group I went to was a Thich Nhat Hanh Sangha. And Thich Nhat Hanh talks a lot about self-compassion, maybe even more than a lot of other um, Buddhist teachers. And so the woman leading the course talked about the importance of self-compassion and, you know, supporting yourself when times are difficult, which they were for me. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I, I tried it out and it worked. I couldn't believe it. It worked. <laughs> and then, yeah, then I when I got um, to the University of Texas at Austin, I thought I wanted to research it and kind of went from there. So Ty, I uh, use the phrase self-compassion. Well, yeah, he, it wasn't him, but it was it was his main center in the United States. And mm -hmm. yet the woman leading um, his group, well, I'm trying to think. She may not have used the word self-compassion. Mm -hmm. She used compassion for yourself. Mm -hmm. And it is true that in, in really even in Buddhist circles, it's usually talked about as compassion for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think... Um, I may have, I think you're right, I may have yeah. popularized the term self-compassion because um, after I finished at UC Berkeley, I, I did two years of postdoctoral study with one of the country's leading self-esteem researchers. And I really wanted to contrast self-esteem to self-compassion mm -hmm. and try to argue to the field of psychology that this is a much better way to go in terms of feeling, um, you know, okay about yourself. And I think that's probably the primary reason I did it. A lot of Buddhists actually don't like the term because it's got the S word in it. So. Self? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's basically, it's just compassion turned inward. I don't really see it as separate from compassion for others. It's just including yourself. Uh-huh. Well, I love that distinction between self-esteem and self-compassion. I actually quote you all the time. So while I have you, I might as well have you quote yourself <laughs> and talk about the distinction rather than my try. Right. Yeah. Well, so self-esteem is basically based on judgment and evaluation, you know, a positive one. So if you judge that you're a good, worthy person, that you're special and above average, that you tend to have high self-esteem. And if you don't make that positive judgment, you have low self-esteem. And, you know, the, the real benefit of self-compassion over self-esteem is that it's not a judgment at all. In fact, you might see yourself clearly and say, wow, I really messed up. That was not very good at all. But still have that compassionate response like you'd show to a friend, like, hey, you're doing the best you can. You know, you're only human. You are still worthy of care and kindness just because you're a sentient being, right? And so the sense of self-worth we know through research is much more stable when it comes from self-compassion. I mean, self-esteem in many ways is a fair-weather friend, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Like, there for you when you succeed, 
But when you fail, when you really need it, it deserts you. Yeah. Um, but that's precisely where self-compassion steps in. And that's why, I mean, in both are linked at mental well-being. It's just that um, it, self-compassion is a more stable source of self-worth. At least that's what I find in my research. Well, you know, in all the teaching that I've done on loving kindness and compassion, um, I feel like I've met uh, certain controversies over and over again. So I want to ask you about how that strikes you in, in terms of your work. So um, okay. one is the very term compassion I found is often thought of in Western culture as a kind of secondary virtue. You know, like if I can't be brave or I can't be wonderful, I can't be fantastic, then maybe I can be kind, you know, it's all right. But there's a certain uh, association often with compassion and weakness that, that I find. Yeah, no, that's true. It's actually one of the main blocks. And I have to say it's a little bit more for um, people who take more masculine, traditional masculine gender roles. Mm -hmm. um, they, they think it's a weakness that it kind of, you know, it's soft. Um, of course, you know, that's why the research is so great, because we know from the research that when, when the going gets tough, <laughs> you know, you want self-compassion to help you through it. It's a tremendously powerful source of coping and resilience. I mean, what's the opposite of compassion towards yourself? Basically, judging yourself, putting yourself down, feeling isolated, you know, being lost in your storyline of how terrible things are. <clears throat> well, that's no that's no good place to find strength, right? Mm -hmm. um, the strength comes from recognizing, you know, hey, I'm doing the best I can. Um, failure is, we all learn from failure. It's part of the human experience. Being mindful, in, in my definition, as you know, I, inc I include mindfulness as part of self-compassion. And then I'm just, I'm kind and supportive to myself. It's like going into battle with an ally at your side as opposed to an enemy. And, of course, having your allies with you is going to make you stronger mm -hmm. than, than, you know, having those enemies in your ear. I wonder if you could say something about the research because I I don't actually know it. And although I, I keep saying, I hear there's research <laughs> or I think there's research because I asked somebody yeah. a while ago and they said, well, uh, performance studies are showing that a very kind of stressful, harsh environment um, will spike your performance, but briefly, and then you'll crash. Right, right, yeah. And so what we know is self-compassion in terms of, like, performance. One of the things it does is it lessens performance anxiety, mm -hmm. right? And it reduces cortisol levels, for instance. Um, which is linked to that kind of fight or flight response, and so yeah, I think it is true when, when it's really stressful that the stress actually um, may increase your performance. But but that's external stress, right? Mm -hmm. Internal stress, which is caused by cutting yourself down, believing you know, hanging your head in shame, feeling you aren't good enough, that everyone's better than you, that it's just you who's messed up. That source of internal stress does not help performance, right? And so external stress, you know, um, yeah, it can actually be helpful. We actually learn best when we're challenged as opposed to completely complacent. Um, but you don't want, you don't need to, put it this way, we got enough stress in the real mm -hmm. world. We don't need to add to it by adding internal stress um, of self-criticism. And so just to give one example of a study, we looked at um, veterans who had seen combat over in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we measured their self-compassion level when they came home, and then we followed up for nine months to see which of the soldiers developed PTSD symptoms or not. And self-compassion, their level of self-compassion was actually a stronger predictor of whether or not they developed PTSD than how much action they had seen, mm. right? So it kind of shows you it's not even just what life throws at you. It's how do you relate to yourself when times are difficult? Do you, again, do you cut yourself down? Do you hang your head in shame? Do you feel all alone? Or do you, do you hold yourself with this kind of kind, connected, mindful presence? And when you do that, you're going to be much more able to cope with the difficulties. So in a way, it makes you, in every way probably, it makes you more effective, uh, more able to make progress, more able to learn something, do well at what you're trying. Right, yeah. I mean, so so the research, you know, doesn't show, for instance, that 
um, students with more self-compassion get better grades. Mm-hmm. Because actually, you know, self-criticism, it kind of works. Mm-hmm. Some some degree, some people get very far mm-hmm. with their harsh self-critic. But what happens is it starts having these secondary knock-on effects, which aren't so useful, mm-hmm. like performance anxiety. For instance, my, my dissertation student, she just got a paper published showing how um, people with less self-compassion, they're afraid to raise their hand in class. Mm. Because they're, you know, afraid of looking dumb to the teacher, which means they don't get the knowledge they learn, right? And um, they, they know in sports, for instance, it can create performance anxiety, which can get in your way. So, and and then the big thing, of course, eventually is burnout. You know, when you just live with this constant self-criticism and shame and haranguing in your head all the time, it's going to take its toll on you emotionally. So, um, you know, you might say self-compassion and self-criticism are two different sources Mm -hmm. of uh, of motivation, right? So self-compassion, like motivating yourself because you care and you want to do well, is actually more sustainable and has less negative side effects than motivating yourself because you're afraid you're going to be a failure. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's was, lots of research. If you, go to, if you go to my website, look on the section on self-compassion and motivation if you ever can't sleep one night. Sure, oh, definitely I will. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that is an issue for a lay person such as myself yeah. because I don't yeah. know exactly. I had not known until this moment where to go. Yeah, uh, no, I've got all, all the research organized by category on my website. I, that's why I've, I think I've really tried to make it accessible to the common person so that they can see for themselves and judge for themselves as it worth trying. That's fantastic. Yeah. It's so great. Well, you know, so many times if I talk about um, uh, not only meditation instruction, which we'll get to in, in a minute, but just yeah. in life, you know, when you've made a mistake and you've blown it or you haven't said something so skillfully, yeah. what's the way to really develop resilience? What's the way to kind of bounce back? And it, it doesn't seem to be through haranguing yourself for 40 hours, you know. Right, which exactly. leaves you both demoralized and exhausted. There's something else that, that maybe can help us. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, from my point of view, it, it's both mindfulness and warmth. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't need to tell you about this mm-hmm. because you're kind of, from my mind, one of the Buddhist teachers who most explicitly brought in the warmth. But there are many mindfulness meditation teachers who just talk about you know, the open awareness, the mm-hmm. non-resistance, and that's huge. It's crucial. We have to have that. But if there's no warmth, mm-hmm. it, then you don't feel safe. It's the warmth that creates a sense of safety, and it's a sense of safety and connection that actually allows us to thrive and do our best. So we really need, from my point of view, to explicitly cultivate both. But again, I know I'm preaching to the No, no, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> this is wonderful. Yeah. Um Maybe uh, before I go on to some of the other questions, you can talk about the three components of self-compassion. Yeah, yeah. So, so like I said, mindfulness is essential for self-compassion. I, I think for all compassion, you know, in order for us to have this kind of open-hearted response to suffering, we have to be willing and able to turn toward that suffering, right? So the reason we often don't have compassion for Maybe that homeless person on the street is because we just, we just can't take it in. It's just too much. So we need our mindfulness to be able to be present with even difficult things like suffering. And we need to accept it to the extent that we can be with it long enough to have this, you know, open-hearted response. And then, of course, we need... We need so so one, the first component is mindfulness. Um, the second component is the kind response, the warmth, the caring, the support, that feeling of, you know, is there anything I can do to help? Really, compassion is commonly defined as um, concern with the alleviation of suffering. And that's where the kindness comes in, you know, the, the caring concern. But um, it was interesting, I was reading... Um, I was I was reading your book and I was reading um, Jack Cornfield's book and Tara Brock had it come out with her book yet darn it when I was formulating mm-hmm. this model it would have been so helpful mm-hmm. but you know Jack talks a lot about and and a lot of teachers talk a lot about you know, pity being the near enemy mm-hmm. of compassion mm-hmm. and I was really concerned with well, what's the difference between self compassion and self pity mm-hmm. because self pity isn't helpful and of course the difference is other people right? Mm -hmm. Self-pity is me, just me. It's all very, very self-focused. Compassion, you know, of course, if you look at the Latin, come means with, passion means suffer, to suffer with. There's an an inherent connectedness in the experience of compassion. So 
So that's where the third component comes in of common humanity. It's really necessary because if you just think, you know, poor me, that's actually not very helpful. You kind of get lost in the rabbit hole of rumination and just, you know, going down and down and down. But when you remember, wait a second, everyone's imperfect. Everyone leads an imperfect life. Everybody struggles. There's nothing wrong with me for having this difficult experience. It's part of life. Then once we make that reframed, you know, remembering that everyone, the human experience is about struggle and joy, the whole, the whole shebang, but it certainly is partly about struggle. Then when we reframe it that way, it gives us a sense of a strength and that feeling that we aren't alone, and it allows us to feel more connected with our brothers and sisters, which is another source of strength. Mm-hmm. And I think that kind of connection figures throughout one's life and one's efforts to be free. I, I remember when I was maybe at a real low point um, in my practice, really, because it was just bringing up stuff for my life. And uh-huh. um, I was doing this intensive retreat. I wrote, I wrote about this in my book, Faith. So, um, and the chapter heading is despair. So uh-huh. I, was in, I was in this state of despair. And um, I had a, a turnaround, something really shifted inside of me. And in that moment, this line from uh, Rilke came up which is something like, um, do not be frightened if a sadness greater than you've ever known before rises up in front of you. Life has not forgotten you. Uh, And that was like the moment of reconnection to a bigger picture of life. And and that was the relief, you know, that was the opening. And not that I felt delighted at the crummy things I was feeling, you know, but But it it was totally different. And I see that again and again for people that, It's not exactly the same as misery loves company, but there's something so freeing in understanding that we're not alone. Yeah, and then, you know, when I was actually formulating the the model, I I call it common humanity because it's easy to understand, but from my perspective, it actually goes deeper and actually goes towards interdependence or interbeing, you know, Mm -hmm. no separate self. When you start cultivating the wisdom of compassion and seeing how we're all connected and there really is no separate independent self that we know of, then it also really helps us hold the suffering more easily when we don't take it so personally. Um, but I, I usually don't talk about that just because it's kind of a head scratcher in your being. <laughs> <laughs> well, it takes care of your S word problem. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> so, you know, that would make... Um, all three of those components really the building blocks toward resilience because yeah. uh, life is such that we are always having to start over and begin again and yeah. kind of change course or, or do some kind of alteration because it hasn't worked out exactly the way we had wanted it to. That's right. But, you know, the wonderful thing about compassion, again, it is, I mean, of course you know this, but, you know, I, I like to tell people that um, another way to describe what the three components of uh, mindfulness, kindness, and common humanity feel like is loving, connected presence. And so when you're in a state of self-compassion, even though it may be very painful, a lot of pain there, you're actually holding that pain with loving, connected presence. And loving, connected presence is actually a positive emotion. Mm -hmm. It feels really good. It actually, as we know from from the research, it activates the reward centers of the brain. And so what you're kind of doing is you're holding your pain, you aren't getting rid of it, with po- it's not like positive thinking, but you're holding the pain in this loving, connected presence, generating this positive emotion that surrounds and holds the negative emotion, and it, it just makes it a lot more bearable. Is, is it true that one of the exercises you have for kindness is imagining that you're delivering a message to a friend or somebody sitting in a chair next yes, to you. Yes, yes. Yeah. So for, for most people, and especially for like adolescents or even children, um, the easiest way to describe what self-compassion is, is kind of treating yourself with the same kindness, care, and support that you would show to a good friend who was struggling. And so, and for a lot of people, it's hard for them to think of 
you know, how to be kind to themselves. They haven't really done it. It feels awkward. It feels fake. And so I often invite people, well, just, just imagine that you had a good friend you cared about who was going through the exact same situation you're mm-hmm. going through. Think about what you would say to them and then try it on with yourself. And that's often an easier access point because that the friend, the muscle of being compassionate to others is far more developed in most people. So. And that brings me to one of my other major controversies, controversies that I've faced, I feel, in speaking about loving kindness and compassion, which is um, describing it as a skill, something that uh, we can build, something that you use the phrase, the muscle of compassion. Yeah. Um, you know, a training uh, yeah. is actually something a lot of people take some offense at. Really? I'm surprised. <laughs> Yeah. No one says that about mindfulness. Oh, yes. No, it's true. It's something about, I don't know <laughs> if it's that we tend to think of compassion as kind of a gift and you either have it or you don't, oh, or it's just yeah. a, a kind of spontaneous, immediate uh, reaction to things. But the idea, it sounds very cold, and it does sound a little cold, like I'm going to train and in compassion, but you have to understand what that means, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you need to practice it, right? And, you know, our brains are plastic. And so for most of us, the, the connections that are the, the, well, the well-worn grooves are toward criticism and judgment, especially toward ourselves, but, you know, also to others. Um, so you've got to wear some new grooves in your brain. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's how the brain works, you know. Um yeah, and 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 by the, you know, I suppose if I were to get kind of more philosophical about it, it's not even that I think that somehow we are generating compassion as separate individual selves. I mean, once you kind of realize that that whole idea of a separate individual self is a bit problematic to begin with, mm-hmm. I I think you can say you're training to tap into this loving, connected presence, which is beyond ourselves. And and I wonder if that's where people um, are a little offended because mm-hmm. they think it comes from the separate self, which I really don't think. Um, for instance, a lot of the metaphors I would use in my guided meditations would have to would have to do with like feeling like you're floating on this ocean of compassion or you're breathing mm-hmm. in this field of compassion. It is bigger than ourselves, almost by definition. Um, so that's interesting. I, I'm... <laughs> I'm surprised that you get flack. I thought everyone revered you. <laughs> I do. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> You're so sweet. <laughs> um, no, I mean, of course I get flack. It's it's uh, well, I mean, in when I teach meditation practice, even if it's working with the feeling of the breath and trying mm-hmm. to stabilize attention, I, uh, as you know, I emphasize the moment where we've already blown it, you know, we've gotten distracted, we've gotten lost, we've fallen asleep. Um, yeah. So I really describe it as a practice of recovery. It's the letting go and the coming back that's most important. Yeah. And it's like the secret ingredient in that is self-compassion because yes. I don't think you can actually do it. We're so trained toward, you know, judgment and harshness that you have to be deepening self-compassion in order to even do the exercise. Right, yeah. You know, and, and yeah. as soon as I... Uh, you know, either bring up the term or say, you know, this translates into life when we've made a mistake or we've we've kind of mm-hmm. blown it. Being able to begin again, somebody will say, "Well, that's just laziness." You know, that's like saying, "Oh, I'll I'll make a mistake. I'll forgive myself. It doesn't matter if I make another one in ten seconds. I'll just forgive myself again." Right? Yeah. yeah. But no one says but it to you. Huh? <laughs> no, no, I I get a lot of that. Okay. No, I mean, but but I'm not. But I'm not Sharon Salzberg. <laughs> no, I get a lot of flack for all sorts of things. But um, no, because again, that that's that mis that's a misunderstanding about what compassion is. You know, when, when you care about yourself, you want to get it right. Mm-hmm. But it, if you, if you make a mistake, it doesn't mean that somehow you are unacceptable. So um, just like a parent, a parent, you know, when, when their parents teaching their child to walk and the child falls down, saying "stupid kid," mm. it's not going to help very mm-hmm. much, is it? Mm-hmm. You know, and the but, but the parent wants the child to walk. The parent wants the child to learn, and they're going to help out of a place of care. It's not laziness. This acceptance. Um, so of course, like anything, it can be misused. Mindful, anything can be mm-hmm, misused. Mm-hmm. Mindfulness, uh, meditation practice, it can all be misused if our intention 
isn't pure. Mm -hmm. And that's why, it, again, it's, I'm preaching to the converted, but you always have to check in with your intention. You know, mm -hmm. what do you, what's your true intention? And if your true intention is to help yourself and to be kind to yourself and to alleviate suffering, you aren't just going to like be lazy and let yourself off the hook because that's not going to make you happy in the long run. Um, but you don't have to, you don't have to beat yourself up when you, when you fall down, you can do it with constructive criticism you know, encouragement, support. So um, that's great. I, I want to ask you a question kind of from the other side, which is also, a, uh, it's not so much a critique, but it's a comment that I often hear where somebody will say, well, I'm only going to focus on love and compassion for myself. Uh, and then only later will I be able to successfully have any compassion for others because the the deficit is really with myself. And, I usually say, well, that, that seems a little out of balance to me, you know, that it, then it's a project, yeah. you know, <laughs> how do you know when yeah. you've done it? <laughs> like, <laughs> Well, I mean, one thing, it may interest you just empirically. I mean, I know a lot of people say you have to have compassion mm -hmm. for yourself before you can have compassion for others. It's actually empirically false. <laughs> oh, good. I said, I said just, I, yeah. mean, I didn't know the science, but. <laughs> yeah, no, in, in fact, um, there's, among college undergraduates, there's a zero correlation. It's a little better among meditators and people who are older and wiser. Uh -huh. It's not very strong, but it's always it's always in the direction, almost always in the direction of people being more compassionate to others than they are to themselves. And so there are there are people who actually are very um, they're truly compassionate to others. They aren't faking it. Mm -hmm. They're very compassionate, giving loving people to others. And they aren't compassionate to themselves. It, it absolutely can exist. The problem, of course, is those people eventually burn out. Yeah, yeah. So it's not very sustainable, but it can exist. Um, but I agree. I mean, so there, there, put it this way. I think that there is some usefulness to focusing on the place where you need the most help. And so that's why I focus on self-compassion mm -hmm. um, because that's where people usually they, they have less than compassion for others. But for instance, for our, in our program, the Mindful Self-Compassion Program, we also teach compassion for others. It's mm -hmm. just that's kind of not as prominent. Self-compassion is kind of in the foreground. Compassion for others is more in the background, but we teach both. And then other programs like Compassion Cultivation Training, it's the reverse. They emphasize compassion for others but also teach self-compassion as well. You, you need both. It's just kind of at the moment you may need to focus a little more on one depending on where you're at and what you're, what you're trying to learn. I'm so glad you said that. I, I wrote in uh, Real Love, which was my most recent book, that I didn't really believe you had to love yourself totally in order to love others. And I got into some trouble about that too. I can show you that I can send you the article. Oh, Sharon. please do. <laughs> send You're me a link. You're a scientist. Yeah, well, but cause you know, because you know, because you, you know, a lot of people have that exact pattern. They're very loving and kind and it's true love and kindness and they don't extend it to themselves. And, and that's the missing bit. And so I think, um, I do think though that ultimately, if your goal is, you know, awakening from this illusion of separate self, you can't do that if you treat yourself and others so radically different, mm -hmm. differently. I mean, it's it's a block. It, it can it can be done, but it's hard to sustain. And I think it will block eventually waking up to the truth because. The reality is all sentient beings are worthy of compassion, including mm -hmm. ourselves. Mm -hmm. And to treat yourself like somehow you don't deserve it, but others do, that's, um, you know, that's not really, it's just, I don't, from my point of view, it's not true. It's not wise. Well, I, I mean, I totally agree. And I would also explain it in terms of sustainability, because first yeah. of all, there's the issue of motivation or intention, as you you brought up. I think if we you know, endlessly give and give and give and can't receive or, uh, yeah. you know, what happens is that our motivation and generosity gets sort of distorted and and we're giving because we don't feel maybe we deserve to have anything or we yeah. feel obliged. Yeah. It's not actually like a freely given gift and there needs yeah. to be a different mix happening inside, yeah. you know, which has to do with some regard for ourselves. Yeah. Do you want me to t tell you another trick oh, yes, you pull out in your lectures? Okay, because a lot of people um, 
really, a lot of women especially yes. feel it selfish to have self-compassion mm-hmm. because they've been so socialized to sacrifice. But you, you probably know about mirror neurons, I assume, mm-hmm. um, right? And so if you think about it, if you're just giving toward others, maybe you're with a patient or your child or your elderly parent, and you're feeling absolutely self-critical and you aren't good enough and you're feeling frustrated, but you're being really kind to the other person, the other person, their mirror neurons are also resonating with your internal feelings of shame, feeling self-critical, being frustrated, right? Because, the, the, you know, mirror neurons, empathy happens at the pre-verbal level. So no matter how kind you are, they're also picking up on this other energy. You can't really hide it from people. The human brain is very good at feeling what others are feeling. But, and I learned this with my son, you know, who, who has autism, and mm-hmm. he used to have these horrible tantrums. And what I learned very quickly is that if I could turn first to myself and flood myself with this loving, connected presence, he would calm down. You know, so in other words, the people when you when you are full of loving, connected presence, other people, their mirror neurons are resonating with you, mm. and they're actually getting a secondary benefit as opposed to you being full of shame and self criticism. So that's an, that's another reason why self compassion is not selfish because if everyone you come in contact with gets to tune in to your loving, connected presence, then you're just then you're just giving lots of little gifts to the world. You know, in addition to having more physical and emotional resources to give to others. So I, I really think for, you know, whether you're the parent of, a, parent of a special needs kid or a therapist or a nurse or whatever, any sort of caregiver, you have to have self-compassion, and it's actually the best gift you can give to those you care for. Oh, that's beautifully put. You know, I I don't know how you feel about the distinction that's sometimes made between empathy and compassion. I think it's important. Okay, yeah. good. Because <laughs> I'm about to quote it. Um, good. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we don't disagree on anything. <laughs> no, it's so, I'm odd. You know, your amazing work, and um, you know the uh, idea being that empathy, uh, not so much a cognitive empathy, but a really felt sense yeah. of resonating with the situation of someone else, like if they're having difficulty, if they're under stress. Yeah they're in pain so it's this felt sense and then compassion is one possible response to yeah. that felt sense but it's not actually the only response it's not the yeah. inevitable response and That's very true you know i often think about it because um there is a growing and i think essential emphasis on empathy training this can be a, a very cold harsh world and often is and uh, for people to be more empathic, to have that sensibility of finding themselves in others' experience is very important. But I also work a lot with caregivers, who people who either in their professional or personal lives are in that role of, you know, uh, working with someone who's suffering or taking care of someone who's yeah. having a difficulty of some kind. And, and I would say they have plenty of empathy. They don't need any more empathy. There's exactly. some other reason people are burning out, and they are burning out. Yeah. Well, yeah, you have to be able to hold it. You have to be able to hold empathetic resonance. And so we teach people in our program, sometimes you actually need to turn away in the Mm -hmm. moment temporarily Mm -hmm. from the other other person's pain and focus on, this is so hard for me right now. I feel overwhelmed. I I don't know what to do. I'm confused. You know, you have to sometimes have to give yourself the compassion first before you can even take in the pain of the other. Um, but you know one group of people who've got great empathy skills um, are con men. Con yeah, men it's true. <laughs> are very good. You know, they, that's how they know when to strike and how to manipulate you because they're very good at reading and feeling. You know, whether or not it's cognitive empathy or feeling, I, I think it's not exactly clear, but they certainly are in touch with what other people are feeling, but they don't care about it. Uh-huh. And so compassion, from my point of view, adds the caring, the concern, you know, wanting to do something to help alleviate it. Oh, that's great. I never I never went that far. I us, usually say, you know, like, you might have the empathy and uh, be exhausted, you know, just feel right. I don't have any wherewithal within me to give. Or you might have the empathy and feel frightened by what you're seeing and feeling capable. And you might have the empathy. This came from, uh, actually, I had a conversation with a therapist not so long ago uh, who told me he found himself... Uh, 
blaming all of his clients. Like they would be saying something and he'd be thinking, I told you six months ago, you know. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, or we, yeah. you know, we might have the empathy genuinely so and then fall into that sort of uh, over heroic, I'm going to save you. I'm going to be the one. And, um, yeah. you know, there needs to yeah. be a very different balance for it to genuinely be compassion. Yeah. That, and that definitely includes compassion for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting because burnout is also um, it's so prevalent, you know, like in working with uh, largely through the Garrison Institute, uh, first working with domestic violence shelter workers, now international humanitarian work, aid workers yeah. and, yes. um, you know, such huge caring and and sensitivity and, and amazing work and and so much burnout. Yeah, yeah. You, so I'm actually I'm working on now trying to develop a brief um, version of our eight-week mindful self-compassion program that's just six one-hour sessions um, for healthcare workers and doctors mm -hmm. who work in a children's hospital. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when you're dealing with sick children and children with cancer and all that stuff, or any, anyone in the medical profession these days, we're losing doctors so fast, partly. There's a lot, there's a lot of structural reasons, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, partly just because people can't handle the pain they face every day. And so uh, we're, we're still collecting our data, but it, it seems to be going well. Um, but, yeah, I absolutely... I absolutely feel that self-compassion has to be taught to anyone in the caregiving profession um, just to be able to survive, you know. So do you find that people, um, this is a gender thing maybe as well, mm -hmm. um, like when I was first teaching loving kindness practice and compassion practice in this country, and uh, I think I was the first Westerner certainly within the you know, the tradition of meditation that I was representing. And uh, I got a lot of criticism about that, too. This was long ago. That's crazy. You know, uh, and looking back, you know, oh, that's just a sentimental practice. You don't give me wisdom that way. It's just like a feel-good thing. And then I realized, oh, they were kind of saying that's like a girly practice, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember the first New York Times article that came out about my work. One of the comments was, oh, great, just that we need a nation of sissies. Ooh. <laughs> like, yeah, I know. Ooh. <laughs> I was so shocked. But, yeah, that, that's the sentiment. Um, yeah, you know, so it's it's interesting, Sharon. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about where my work is going now. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of the new edge of my practice. I'm, I'm curious to know your thoughts about it. Um, so, and this is a concept I developed with, with Chris Germer, but I'm kind of starting to run with it. And that's the idea of the yin and the yang of mm. self-compassion. And this would apply to compassion for others as well. So the yin side of compassion is kind of that loving, connected presence, is being able to be with our pain or be with others' pain and validate it and kind of comfort and soothe. Um, but there's also a yang aspect of compassion, and that's what, you know, of course, is known as fierce compassion, mm -hmm. right? And fierce compassion is protecting, motivating, providing, taking action in the world to alleviate suffering. So there's really two ways to alleviate suffering. One is from being with in this tender way, and one is by acting in the world in a fierce way. And with all the stuff that's going on in the world politically, yeah. I am talking about how women, all people, but I'm because I'm a woman, I guess I'm focusing more on that. How women need fierce compassion. We need to stand up and say, mm -hmm. "No, it's not okay," and we're going to speak up and and use our mindfulness not just to be with, but mindfulness also is useful to see the truth. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see the truth. We're going to tell the truth. We're going to, you know, common humanity. Me too. We're going to stand together and we're going to act to protect ourselves and our sisters. And and as you know, I mean, there's a long tradition. Um, looking at fierce compassion in Buddhist writings, although I don't know, I, I actually just wrote a, a blog piece on this in, in direct response to the Supreme Court um, mm -hmm. confirmation hearings, a whole Me Too movement, because I think, I think women really have to, again, explicitly cultivate fierce compassion, yang compassion, mm -hmm. and not just yang compassion. What do you think about that? I think, where's the blog, by the way? Where is it published? <laughs> it's on my website. On my website. If, you okay. the, if you go to the top, and um, yeah, I think I think it's called Why Women Need Fierce Compassion. You can click on it. And I think um, uh, uh, Greater Good's going to sound out a slightly longer piece I wrote. but 
That's fantastic. I think it's it's great. It reminds me. I think it's very true, and I think it reminds me of um, something I tried to say, although uh, I don't know how well I said it in my last book, Real Love, because I was trying to talk about balance, and mm-hmm. I, I wasn't so. I mean, the stories I told were gender specific. Um, uh, although these days it's very hard because of this gender fluidity and there's yeah, no, you know, many sure. things. Yeah. But um, uh, I was trying to talk about um, ways we grow in freedom to really love most authentically. And that's going to look different for different people and it's going to look different at different times. So I was yeah. struck by that because I have a, a male friend who told me, and this was one of the originations of the book, he told me that he felt for him to, you know, truly love, um, he, he more or less had to get off the seat of privilege mm-hmm. and listen to his wife so that her desires were, were not in a way almost secondary, you know? It's like he yeah. wasn't guiding the course of their decisions about vacations or where they're going to live or whatever. And she might want something that didn't thrill him, but... Um, it's what she wanted, you know, mm, mm-hmm, and and mm-hmm. he said that uh, he he had come to realize that that is what he needed to do. And every time he told me the story, because we're friends, this person, um, I'd say, well, you know, there are plenty of people who like for whom expressing what they want is the way. You know, it's not yeah. it's not giving up. It's not it's not that kind of surrender. And then I told the story of a friend of mine. Um, who many, many, many years ago got a cancer diagnosis and, and pretty dim prognosis, which she outlived by like 40 years, honestly. And, yeah. But she told me that when she was first diagnosed, she looked at everything in her life, like absolutely everything. And uh, she said, I was the kind of person who would be riding in the car with my husband and I'd be boiling hot. And the most I could bring myself to say was, are you warm, dear? And she said, that changed. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so yeah. I thought, oh, you know, here they are juxtaposed. Like, freedom for her meant saying what she needed, saying what she wanted, not just being, you know, this people pleaser and uh, right. this accessory to her husband's desires. And, yes. and look at that. So there's a kind of balance that, and historically, of course, culturally, there's been a tremendous imbalance in terms of gender disparity. And so here we are, you know? Yeah. And that's why I like the yin and yang. It was actually Tammy Simon who suggested mm-hmm. to us that we use that framework. Because as you say, there's gender fluidity. And, you know, mm-hmm. you might say traditional male roles are more yang, right. traditional right. females are more yin. But this is a dialectic that's within all people. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, you know, it doesn't matter what your gender orientation is. You know, these are, we, both, we need both energies in balance within us. And I think for many, many people, and I think and certainly in our society, they aren't in balance. So it really is about trying to bring these two energies in balance and make sure that both are developed. Now, of course, what I'm finding, I don't know if you have any tips for me, but I'm finding it's difficult to mm-hmm. balance the yang with the yang. When I'm yang, you know, I'm mm-hmm. feeling like I'm feeling the energy through my spine. I'm feeling like that fierce mama bear energy. Mm-hmm. And sometimes fierce mama bear is a little too fierce, you yeah, know, and yeah. I recognize that as an issue and, you know, wanting, I need also, I check in and say, well, okay, what, what's the inside of me say about this? But it, it's difficult because they feel so different. Yeah, well, they do. And I, you know, I, I teach, sometimes I, I've taught workshops with Robert Thurman on fierce compassion uh-huh. and, you know, we'll talk about compassion and all these things and, and sort of the gentle self side. And then Bob will say, but then for women, you know, you've yeah. been held back for too long, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. But I, I'm also so used to, in my thinking, um, making a distinction, an internal distinction between what's motivating me and what I'm, uh, how I'm expressing something in the moment, you know. So, mm-hmm. um, and I do try to have a motivation and, and keep cultivating a motivation of of working toward the good, you know, and right. trying yeah. to help. And if I feel like I am 
simply trying to destroy something, not change their actions or protect someone or mm-hmm. protect myself, but really destroy them, then I might say take a breath, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but if I if I have some sense of trust in that motivation, then I think the we've unfairly circumscribed our options for action, you know? Like, yeah. Uh, but we know, everybody knows these days, you know, that if you have a friend, say, who's drinking a lot, um, you can't perhaps endlessly give them money, you know? Yeah. There may yeah. come a time when you need to say, well, you know what? I love you, and I don't want to be complicit in your action. Right. You know, yeah. or, and it's it's agony so many times because the love is there, and um, in those cases, or... Uh, and yet, you know, and yet. So uh, yeah. we have to have a range of action really available to us and not feel, well, I've, I've only got to smile and say yes. Yes. And I, I kind of think what's happening with women on a more global level is like, I talk about it as the collective arising of the female yang. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's kind of happening. Yeah. Thank goodness. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, one of the things that's, you know, kind of most uh, poignant in this time is that, um, you know, all of a sudden people, friends or, uh, or you know, uh, professional acquaintances or something, uh, people are telling their stories. Oh, yeah. And, you know, so people are, are turning to me and say, well, I was, you know, like, and uh, you know, and, and this happened to me when I was a child, and this is a woman who's over 80, and, and you think, oh, really, you know, I'm like, and there's been a lot. There's a lot of abuse. There's a lot of exploitation. There's a lot of injustice. And yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And I, I do think that women are finally, you know, and not, not just women. A lot. There's a lot of yeah, male allies. Yeah, yeah. But it has to come from us if it's going to stop happening. You know, we have. We can't wait for men to grow up. <laughs> like not to put all men down. I mean, there are lots of lovely, wonderful men. But the men who, the type of men who do abuse, we can't just wait for them to grow up, right? We need to collectively say no and talk about it immediately and just change the whole way we deal with it. Um, but, you know, it, it's hard because, I mean, I, what I write about my blog is if you look at, like, the, um, you know, the testimony of Dr. Blasey Ford, mm-hmm. she had to be so soft, yeah. you know, and she and she she probably did, you know, in order to be heard. But you know, if a woman, I'm 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 a pretty young woman, <laughs> and it doesn't always go over so well, Doctor you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's like it's like we just have to not care. Yeah. Really. Well, you know, there's also I'm I don't know if it's just me, but I, I seem to know a lot of men who've been abused. Yeah. No, that that's very true. Yeah, and they really, they really can't say anything about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, you know, and, and perhaps this is a moment in time where um, they can have a voice. You know, that's a very significant yes addition yes. to the conversation as well. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think yeah. it's it's really powerful. Yeah, well, I, I just it just seems to be a useful framework for mm-hmm. talking about things, which is why I think my next book is going to be about this. So, mm-hmm. which is still not it's not fleshed out, but I'm going to be writing a proposal soon, just because I've had so many um, people tell me that's really useful, mm-hmm. you know, just mm-hmm. as a way of framing it. So, all right, yeah, we'll I need look to take to to yeah, I need to take your next fierce compassion retreat, Sharon. Tell me, what okay, I will. <laughs> <laughs> I will for sure. Uh, well, and I've told you this before, but I mean, your work was so, I mean, my, this whole movement of my work wouldn't have been born without your work. I mean, really, it, it, it was so hugely important and essential to development of my ideas and everything. So, just so eternally grateful to you for that. Oh, thank you. Mm. That's really beautiful. So would you like to lead us in a meditation of the world fierce and intense and ready to go forward and change the world? <laughs> Yeah, well, I think actually, um, in, uh, instead of doing fierce compassion, because I haven't quite got my, uh, uh-huh. my yeah, yeah. quick, easy fierce compassion practice done yet, but I think maybe something else we were talking about, I can lead us in a little um, practice related to um, self-compassion and when you're car- caring for someone else who's mm-hmm. in pain. Yeah? That's great. Okay. 
All right. So um, if all your listeners close your eyes, let's just take a moment to let go of all that interesting intellectual stuff and come back to our bodies. Right, so just feeling your feet on the floor and if you're sitting, we're the weight of your body on your chair. Um, and calling to mind someone who you care for uh, that's starting to maybe burn you out in so, to some degree. And this, if you're a professional, maybe it's a client you see, or maybe it's a family member, or just someone in your life who's really suffering, and you're you care for them, but you also feel that caring for them is starting to drain you. Okay, so imagining this person in your mind's eye. And then also getting in touch with the feelings you have, the feelings of overwhelm or confusion or stress that come from caring for this other. And then starting to notice uh, each in-breath, each in-breath. Right, so feeling the in-breath. And as you breathe in, imagine that you're breathing in compassion for yourself. Compassion for the struggle of caring for this other, for the difficulties, And as you breathe in, if you want, you can maybe let a word right on your in-breath, a word that something you need right now, maybe strength or courage, patience, love. Really giving yourself permission to breathe in for yourself. It's hard to care for this person. Breathe in compassion for yourself. And then letting the focus on the in-breath and yourself go for now. And now return your, return your focus to the other who you care for, who is struggling. So again, refreshing the image of this other in your mind's eye. And remembering what they're going through, the struggles they're going through. And then starting to focus on each out-breath, right? Feeling the out-breath. And as you breathe out, imagine that you're breathing compassion out for the other. If you want, you can add in some sort of visual, like a glowing golden light, a healing light, or else you can add a word to the breath, something that the other person needs. And again, maybe strength, love, acceptance whatever you think they might need. And then now bringing both together, so feeling the entire breath, the inhalation, 
Breathing in compassion for yourself. And the exhalation, breathing out compassion for the other. So in and out. One for me and one for you. And if at any point you feel you need a little more focus on the in-breath, you're feeling a little overwhelmed, feel free to breathe in more for yourself. Maybe it's three for me and one for you. Or else you can focus more on the other if that's calling you. Or else just let it be an easy, even flow. Compassion in, compassion out. Allow yourself to breathe as easily as you might float on the waves of an ocean. Right, an unbounded, limitless ocean of compassion. More than enough for me and more than enough for you. And then when you're ready, letting go of the practice, um, just checking in with yourself if any difficult feelings are arising, maybe you're feeling uh, numb, maybe you aren't feeling any compassion, <laughs> just try to accept whatever it is you're feeling, right? allowing yourself to be exactly as you are in the moment. Okay, and then you can open your eyes, listeners. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, you know, so I much. That as more, you're That's welcome. Great. I love that as more as a meditation to kind of learn the breathing in and out mm -hmm. practice, but it's actually designed to be used in the moment when you're with the person who's struggling, mm. like at the bedside or with your tantruming child or, you know, when you're working in the woman's shelter. Just remembering to breathe in for you. Breathe out for the other. That was really great. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you for so, so much for taking the time to speak with me. I know you're on your way to give a talk. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so to learn more about Kristen's very inspiring work, you can visit her website at www.self-compassion.org. And I encourage you to get a copy of the Mindful Self-Compassion Workbook, which is now everywhere that books are sold. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Sharon. It was a real honor for me to, to speak with oh, you. And well, lots of fun, you. too. It's great. <laughs> I look forward to the yin and the yang of everything. Good. <laughs> All right. Go well. Thank you, too. Bye-bye. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening. To learn more about Sharon and her ongoing teaching schedule, as well as online courses and a free guided meditation, check out her website at SharonSalzberg.com.